please remain standing and turn to page one for the invocation as we follow a printed order of service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, oh, excuse me, let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers and to lighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for the third Sunday in Advent is from Isaiah, the 61st chapter. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offerings among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes a sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading of Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Be joyful always, pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand once again for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, he said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now that some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, O Christ. We now join together in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We'll sing our sermon hymn. be seated. I have a question. How many of you have Christmas music playing all the time at home? Raise your hand. Yeah, we do now. We haven't even this year, or I think last year for that matter, taken out one CD. And the reason is simple because we, all we have to do is say, Alexa, play my Christmas list. And she's got that, my, you know, and now it'll come up, I can even specify shuffle, and it'll play randomly all different songs or even from the internet. I'm not always sure where that she's gonna grab music from, so I have my prescribed list. But anybody here this morning, are you tired of Christmas music yet? I didn't think so. So let me see how well you know your Christmas music, the sacred kind. I'll give you a line. You tell you, veiled in flesh, the God had see hail the incarnate deity. What hymn? Hark the Herald. Hark the Herald Angels sing. Yeah, great line. Okay. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. Wait, is it going to have to? O little town of Bethlehem. Yeah. Did you get that, Joan? Is that you? Oh, Paula. Oh, I want to give credit where credit's due. Okay. As a nail spear shall pierce him through the cross he bore for you, me, for you. Nail spear shall pierce him through. Oh, that's a tough one. 
Oh, I, I wonder if I should keep you in suspense until next Sunday. No, I, w I won't do that. Um, what child is this? Did somebody say that? Who said that? Who had a correct? Way to go. Okay, great. Pardon? Okay, good. So you know that one. Okay, so now you know. Now we know. You know your Christmas music. Good. Now, I should do this. This would be fun. Okay. How many of you know this song? Hakuna Matata. Joy to the world. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. You have not heard Hakuna Matata? Is, would somebody look at Is it in here? Mm. So now, last year, did I, I didn't just make it up. Um, no, I did not have any eggnog this morning. <laughs> Anybody, uh, Hakuna Matata ring a bell at all? Yeah. Lion. Lion. So now I know what goes on when I'm not home. <laughs> the Lion King is on, yes, that was from, yeah, actually, I guess, uh, you, you can take my word for it, it's Swahili, or I'm taking somebody else's word for it, I should say. Uh, it was made famous in that Lion King movie, 1994, and it means no worries. Yeah, no worries. <coughs> and it's kind of, it's, maybe it's good to have a, a problem-free philosophy, I don't know that it always works, but Pumbaa and Timba were trying to convince Simba not to uh, worry about all his troubles, just Hakuna Matata. That's it, but that's not really a Christmas song. I, I knew that. I just wanted to see if I knew it. I just wanted to see if you guys knew it, but let's pray. Gracious God and Father, we thank you for your blessings in Christ our Savior. We thank you for the abundance of Christmas music to sing about our Savior. Father, we, it would be great this Christmas season if we would take time not only to listen or to sing, but to read and meditate upon the great truths in these hymns. But today, oh God, we pray that you'd speak to us in your holy word. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. So we're making progress through Advent season. We've been unwrapping the gifts of Christmas. A couple weeks ago, we did hope. That was one gift. Last week, we unwrapped the gift of love. And you see the appropriate corresponding Bible verse. I love that. One will arise to rule over the nations, and him the Gentiles will hope. And of course, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This morning we come to the gift. We will unwrap the gift of joy. Now with my bifocals, I can't read it. Somebody want to read that for me? The verse? Thank you. I guess you never knew you'd assist the pastor with a message, did you? Wow. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so today we're going to unwrap that gift of joy. It's interesting because when the angels came and appeared to those lowly shepherds, they didn't say, Hakuna Matata. No, they said, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For he was born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So that was the good news of great joy. And so we respond by singing joy to the world, the Lord has come. And so we hear a lot about joy uh, around Christmas time, and it's, it's okay. It should be a joyous, joyful season. But I don't make that assumption about everybody. The problem is there, there are people that know you ought to be joyful at Christmas time, but it, it betrays what they're experiencing. It doesn't seem like their lives are filled with joy. Sometimes it, because we don't sense the joy that comes at Christmas time, we try to generate synthetic joy, if you will. We try to suppress our emotions. We try to suppress the struggles we're going through. Think if I could just have that worry-free attitude, I'll have that joy. But you don't need to deny reality. You don't need to ignore what's hurting, what's ailing, what's trying in your life to experience that great joy that we have in Christ. Some people, like I said, they, if they don't feel it, they'll, they'll try to simply ignore it, uh, the hurts and stuff. That, But you know what? There's a joy. One of the things we've said, these are gifts. 
They're gifts of the Holy Spirit. As such, a gift is something that is given freely, graciously. It's not something you have to strive for. It's not something you have to manufacture. It is there. It is God's gift. God wants you to share in that gift of joy this Christmas. The gift of joy offered to us in Christ during this Advent season, it, it's not something, it's more than just a feeling. It's a deep and abiding joy that the world can't give and that the world, frankly, cannot take away. It's a joy that is so powerful that it can hold its own even in darkest of times in a hurting and fallen world. In the midst of all our struggles and difficulties, joy is so powerful that it can hold its own. So today, we encourage you to unwrap that gift of joy. I love how St. Peter describes that joy, 1 Peter 1.8, inexpressible and glorious joy, inexpressible, the way I learned it many years ago in the RSV, inexpressible, exalted joy. The joy that Jesus brings is not anything natural, it is supernatural in origin, it's exalted joy. Here's what St. Peter writes, 1 Peter 1.8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not now see him, you believe in him. You're filled with that inexpressible and glorious or exalted joy. I can tell you that everyone wants joy in their life. Men have always stri been striving to find joy, always pursuing joy. Some successfully, I might add, others not so much. But I can tell you there's many sources where people have looked and it's not going to bring you lasting joy, I can guarantee it. Joy is not found in unbelief. I mentioned many times before, or a few times in the past, about Voltaire. He was, this, he was a philosopher. I don't know how you make a living being a philosopher. But he was also a skeptic. He was an infidel, if you will. He was one who totally wanted to obliterate the Bible from France within 100 years of his life. I mentioned during the Reformation service that we had uh, messages that the house where he died became a place where they printed Bibles years later. Amazing. But he discovered in his unfortunate life that joy is not found in unbelief or infidelity. He said, I wish I had never been born. I wish I had never been born. Joy is not found in unbelief. Joy is not found in pleasure. Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure if anyone ever had. Yet he wrote, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine and mine alone. Joy is not found in pleasure. Joy is not found in money. J. Gould, the American millionaire, had plenty of that. Yet when he was dying, said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. Joy is not found in money. Joy is not found in position or in fame. Lord Beaconsfield uh, enjoyed more than uh, his share of both fame and position, and yet he wrote, Youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, and old age a regret. Joy is not found in position or fame. Joy is not found in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day, and having done so, he wept in his tent before he said, There are no more worlds to conquer. Joy cannot be found in military glory. Then the question is, where is joy to be found? Where is joy to be found? The answer is simple. It is found in Christ and Christ alone. So my question to you this morning, beloved of Christ, have you discovered that deep and abiding joy that only Christ can give you, a joy that does not come with a season, but it lasts all year? My prayer is that beginning this Advent, this day, throughout the Christmas season and into the new year and beyond, that you'll know the true joy that Christ alone can bring. Now, if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, you know we've unwrapped the, the, that first gift, hope, and then love. And by the way, just by way of review, the word Advent simply means coming or arriving. So we're not only celebrating Christ's birth as coming as a baby in Bethlehem, but we're eagerly waiting with eager expectation and longing and yearning that Christ is coming in in the glory of the Father. 
You see, that's why we noted a couple weeks ago that Advent is that season in the church year that links the past, the present, and the future. Advent offers to us an opportunity to share the ancient longing of God's people for the coming of their Messiah and to celebrate his birth and long for his return in glory. And so as we do each year, we light the Advent wreath, wreath and uh, two weeks ago we lit the candle of hope. Last week we lit the second candle, the candle of love. And today the candle of joy. But I have to tell this joy of which we speak this morning, it's not just a feeling. Because feelings are fitful, they're fluctuating. Feelings can f be fleeting. And they can be unstable and very subjective. But joy is more than a feeling, it's more than just an emotion. It's a state of mind which Christ gives us, a, a way of life that he bestows on us. <clears throat> By the way, we must not confuse joy with happiness because they're not the same. All of us want to be happy. I'm not, I'm not a miserable person. I don't want to be miserable. But let me tell you that happiness can be fleeting as well. It's fitful and fluctuating because what ha happiness depends on what's happening around me. When everything's going well, when all the, everything in my life is coming up roses, oh, it's great, I'm happy. Until something goes wrong. Then the happiness is gone. Happiness is based on happenings, what's happening in my life day to day. But joy is depending on Jesus, and it is constant. It's a joy that's been ours in Christ. It is a joy that's been there from the beginning of time. It's a joy that is celebrated without, throughout the pages of Holy Scripture. Psalm 96, let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the seas resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and let everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. So in Advent, we not only are, are reflecting back on his coming as a baby, but we're looking forward to his coming again. And in that, we rejoice. Although our joy may not be fully realized until that day when he comes, in anticipation of his coming, we can rejoice today. So here's some things, three things I want to give you quickly this morning so you can experience that joy in your life. Number one, anticipate joy. Thinking about how wonderful it is to anticipate something. The, you know, anticipation builds excitement. Anticipation is good. For example, the anticipation of the birth of a child, doesn't that generate excitement and joy in a family? The arrival of that child generates excitement. Does the bride looking forward planning her wedding day, does it build anticipation and excitement and joy? Well, this Christmas season, the anticipation builds day by day. Uh, in fact, for children, uh, anticipation is just about intolerable <laughs> level. But it's an anticipation of what's to come with this family gathering to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Families gathering to express love for one another, that builds anticipation. In fact, research has shown that anticipating something can be powerful. It can generate a positive emotion that can help live joy-filled lives. I think most of us want that. There's something, so what we want to do this morning is anticipate joy. Because when you begin to anticipate joy, when you know something big is coming, something better is coming, those little milestones in our lives, those little mile markers in our lives, weddings, birth of a child, whatever it is, that's something to look forward to. It, it builds joy and anticipation. But there's something even greater to anticipate joy over, and that's the coming of Christ. So that, that is something that we have now that can begin to build. Uh, now, the, the full joy will be realized when Christ comes again, but it's that anticipation of his coming that in every situation of life, we can be filled with constant joy so that it's not up and down. You know, life is an emotional roller coaster, isn't it? Up and down, up and down. Now, I like roller coasters at amusement parks. But I don't like emotional roller coasters as a way of life, but I believe that the joy that Christ gives can keep our life on an even keel as we wait until his coming again. So we need to anticipate joy. When I think back to those, the night when Jesus was born, 
You know, when those angels came, they brought good news to the shepherds. Their, their first reaction was not one of joy. I can tell you that right now. Their first reaction was fear. Until the, and the angels sensed that. They said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born, who is Christ the Lord. When they received that good news, the fear subsided. They came to grips with the fear, and they were filled with joy. And they ran off with haste to see what the angels had proclaimed to them. As you and I walk through this Advent season, we know that Christ our Messiah has come, and we know he will come again. And that should fill us with unspeakable joy. So the first thing we want to do is anticipate joy. And by the way, joy sometimes comes unexpectedly. Sometimes it comes when we least expect it from the source that we might not always expect. I believe God wants to fill you with inexpressible, unanticipated joy, but we need to look forward. The second thing we need to do this morning is recognize joy when we see it. Recognize joy. Not only did the shepherds receive the good news, but in the course of time, so did the Magi. Now, when we, when we do our Christmas pageant, even my, my lawn uh, nativity scene, okay, you basically, you see Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, and you see the shepherds, the wise men, just about everybody else. Actually, do you know the Magi didn't come for two years? How many of you already knew that? They hadn't come for two years, and, and so a lot of times we get a false impression from lawn displays or nativity scenes at home or Christmas pageants. But when the Magi came, they found a toddler. They found a two-year-old doing what two-year-olds do, but he wasn't a terrible, he didn't go through the terrible twos, right? This is the son of God after all. He was a perfect two-year-old toddler. But I want to tell you, they, they, it says when they, at one point in the gospel, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They were overjoyed. Because you have to keep in mind, they, they weren't always filled with joy. This was an arduous journey. This was not a stroll in the park. It was not a walk along the beach. It was a long trek across a desert in uncertainty, facing all kinds of peril. Why did they make such an expensive, difficult, dangerous journey? Because they, they, they knew from the scripture, they knew that this one to be born in Bethlehem was born the king. And when they saw that star, which, by the way, at times they might have lost track of, when they saw that star, they were overjoyed. And on coming into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. They recognized the joy in that one whose presence they sought. So the joy that they had, a joy inexpressible. An exalted joy, not a hakuna matata type of joy, but a deep and abiding joy that only comes from an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly and lastly, choose joy. Choose joy. We anticipate joy, we recognize joy, and we choose joy. Now, the idea that we choose joy can be a bit deceiving. You see, we can't just, in other words, close our eyes focus real hard and strain and somehow magically conjure up joy. It doesn't work that way. In fact, when we try to do it that way, that artificial, that synthetic joy, it leads us away from real joy. Again, joy is a gift. It is a gift that comes from God has no earthly source. Joy is also listed in Scripture in Galatians 5 as a fruit of the Spirit. So we can't just create joy by trying harder. We simply choose joy by choosing to live in a way that is pleasing to God. So you, you just don't magically conjure up joy. It, it doesn't work that way. One of the things I suggest during this Advent and Christmas season, if you're struggling finding joy, I think that there was a little hint at this, how we do that, how we discover that joy in our reading today. Here's how I learned from the RSV. I still think RSV in my mind. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. First of all, what Paul is saying, it's God's will that you rejoice. <coughs> Secondly, 
It's God's will that you pray without ceasing. Thirdly, it's God's will that you give uh, thanks in all circumstances. Even the circumstances you find yourself in right now. I have a roommate from college. I've known John, let's see, about 45 years. And I remember when we were in college, I remind this once in a while, because it's fun to just tweak them a little bit. They used to say, John, how are you doing this morning? John, go fine under the circumstances. It's like he always, he always saw his life that I'm under the circumstances. How are you doing, John? Oh, fine under the circumstances, you know. <laughs> Finally, one guy said that to him. He said, John, how are you doing this morning? What did John say? Good under the circumstances. Guy said, what are you doing down there? What are you doing under the circumstances? Some people feel like they're living under the circumstances and are so weighed down by the circumstances they can't find their way to, find, to joy. Let me tell you, it's a real easy way to choose joy. To start giving thanks to God for what he's given to you. What you could do to begin to be thankful, which will lead to being joy-filled, is give thanks Start naming the blessings that God has given you. Let me ask you this morning, if I had you take out a piece of paper down a pen, could you write down at least three things for which you are thankful? How about five or six or maybe ten? You could probably publish a book of the blessings that God has bestowed on you. When you begin to see what God has given you, when you begin to give thanks and you praise him for all that you have, you'll suddenly see that the joy just comes natural. Because you're not living under the circumstance. You have the circumstances there, but you're, you're, you're a conqueror in Christ. And you can be above the circumstances. In other words, choose an attitude of gratitude. When you don't feel joyful, give thanks. A professor I had, a New Testament instructor when I was in college. Her name was Esther Onstead. One of my, I learned more from her than I learned from any guy in theology, by the way, but don't tell the men that. She passed away just just weeks before she turned 100 years old. But Esther used to say in class on this verse, rejoice always, pray constantly, uh, and give thanks to all circumstances. Rejoice when you feel like it. Rejoice when you don't feel like it. Rejoice until you do feel like it. Pray when you feel like it. Pray when you don't feel like it. And pray until you feel like it. Give thanks when you feel like it. Give thanks when you don't feel like it. And give thanks until you do feel like it. It's amazing when we begin to pray without ceasing, rejoicing, and we're thanking God for all we have, that joy becomes ours. It's not instantaneous, and what comes instantly leaves instantly too, doesn't it? So be grateful. Rejoice always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. That's God's will. Gratitude can go a long way, and it always leads to joy. When you don't know what to do, when you're feeling overwhelmed by the circumstances, when you're under the circumstances, remember this. Thank God, and you'll begin to feel the joy that he brings. One of the other things that's key, to, I believe, to choosing joy is choose to obey in, in John chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus said, he said it to his disciples and he says it to you and me this morning, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. <clears throat> what an amazing thing. I want you to have complete joy. So what did he tell his disciples? What was the secret? Simply obedience. First John, uh, John chapter 15, verse 10 he told his followers to obey his commands. And we often, we often want to pursue joy in some other way, but there's no shortcut. The way to, to joy is through obedience. Choosing also to abide in Christ. I wish you could read through John 15. In fact, there's no reason why you can't for devotions. But Jesus said, I want your joy to be complete. One of the ways we choose joy is by choosing obedience. Also, we choose joy by choosing to abide in Christ. It's not a shortcut. It's not a s simple formula. It's not a, it's not a potion. You see, joy is not something you can turn on like a light, turn it off, 
on off. It's Christmas, yee, I'm happy. Okay, Christmas is over, sad. You can't do that, it's, it's fleeting, but where we find joy, how we choose joy is when we choose to abide in Christ. The whole passage, John chapter 15, is abiding in the vine. He is the vine, we are the branches. When we abide in him, we, we bear much fruit, and part of that fruit is joy. It's a complete joy. It's not something that comes that, that's synthetic that we can manufacture on our own. Let's face it, anything you and I manufacture is not long-lasting at all. So Jesus said, abide in me, and you'll bear much fruit. What this is all about, this, you see, this fruit is not just a seasonal thing. It's here for Christmas. January comes around, and poof, it's gone. This is a deep and lasting and abiding joy that is constant in your life, regardless of circumstances, when you abide in Christ and you imitate his love and his obedience. It, it's, it's not going to come and go. It, it, as The longer we walk with Christ, the longer we abide in him, the longer the joy, the deeper the joy in him. My prayer for you this Advent season that you will know and experience that joy, that inexpressible and exalted joy, not just during Christmas, but in the new year. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus of the life everlasting. Amen. One of the great sources of joy in Christ is to give of our first fruits to him. So we're going to call on the ushers to receive our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Father, this day we rejoice in your goodness and mercy. We rejoice in all your gifts, gift of life and salvation, gifts of your grace not for sale, but freely received in Christ for hope, love, joy, and peace. These gifts that come freely to us in Christ are a present reality, despite what is going on around us. Father, help us in this Christmas season and well into the new year to abide in Christ, our Savior. And Father, even as we abide in him, we see the adversity comes, the testing, the difficulty comes. But Father, when the seasons of testing come, remind us 
that use these tests, these difficulties, to prune the branches that we might bear even more fruit to your glory and honor. Father, help us to live for your glory and honor every day. Father, we look at the world around us, we see things that would steal our peace and joy and hope. It's not going to happen when we abide in Christ. It's a violent world, an uncertain world, a volatile world, and yet we abide in Christ. And when we abide in him, we abide in peace and in hope. Father, we see not only violence in the world, but even in our own streets, in our homes. How desperately we need your peace. How desperately man needs your redemption. Think of the words of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth. I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But peal the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Despite what we see with our own eyes, and it's very real, we rest in hope in Christ. In him we lay down at night and dwell in safety. Father, we rejoice in all the gifts you bestow upon your people. Thank you for the gift of family. We pray for families that are traveling, uh, whether they're coming to Amro or traveling elsewhere, that your hand of protection would be upon them in all their ways. Father, we also rejoice this day with the growing families. We rejoice with Travis and Joanna Newman at the birth of their son, Jackson Matthew, born on December 14th. We pray your blessings upon mom and dad and upon this child. We rejoice with his birth, his arrival. We pray now, Lord, as we anticipate the day of bringing him to you in holy baptism, we rejoice already in his arrival and the addition to your family. Father, we, we thank you for all the blessings you bestow far more numerous than the time allowed this morning. But Father, we also pray for those in need of your healing touch. We pray for those who are hospitalized this week. We think of Phyllis Kintoff recovering now home from surgery. We pray for others, Lord, that are recovering from surgery, undergoing physical therapy, rehabilitation. For those enduring the, uh, the effects of, of cancer treatment, Father, may your hand of grace and healing be upon them. For those that are alone during this Christmas season, it seems the pain grows deeper. Comfort them, befriend them, draw near. They might know your promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. For those in financial need that have great financial difficulties, not sure where to turn, provide for all their needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you that you do hear and answer prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Amen. We now continue on page five with the service of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, calling sinners to repentance that they may escape the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
are bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
let us pray. We give thanks to Almighty and everlasting God that you have refreshed us with this gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us for the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs>